like to start the event. Um, it gives me great pleasure to have Professor Dr. S. Nalrajan here with us, who is an esteemed ophthalmologist with over 35 years of experience. He has performed over 60,000 exclusive vitreous and retinal surgeries, and he has trained more than 68 vitreous retinal surgeons across the globe and has presented more than 1,500 invited guest lectures globally. He is considered an authority in vitreous retinal surgery in the world and is keenly involved in academics and research for the prevention of blindness. He is invited to teach as well as speak in prestigious universities across the globe and his work has been published in hundreds of international journals. He has been awarded the highest civilian, one of the highest civilian awards by India, by the President of India, the Padma Shri. And um, he is also the President of all ocular trauma societies in the world and a pioneer in vitro retinal surgery in India. He is no stranger to us as he has been closely associated with us a uh, few years ago when he collaborated and did difficult surgeries for deserving patients at our hospital. Uh, first slide. Can I have the first slide, please? Hey, remote area. Hmm. You can go, I think, uh, go up, I think, no? backwards. Ah, yes. Ah. Patma Shri Professor Dr. S. Nadrajan is also the Chief Clinical Services of Aditya Jod Eye Hospital in Mumbai. He is also the Chief of Vitro Retinal Services of the Dr. Agarwal's Group of Eye Hospitals in India. He is the President of the Teleophthalmology Society of India, the President of Asia Pacific Ocular Trauma Society, and the Treasurer of the International Council of Ophthalmology. President of the Shankar Nitralaya Alumni and President of the Eye Cancer Society of India. It gives me great pleasure to invite the esteemed Professor Dr. S. Nagarajan to give his speech now. Thank you. So, as a surgeon, uh, all the uh, observation systems and uh, what's happening in the OT is very interesting, but now. For a long time, I'm working on this recent advances in artificial retina, retina stem cell, and gene therapy. It's very close to my heart. Now, I actually, after four decades of working as a vitreous surgeon, my dream is to work on these new things only, so that we can do these patients who are going blind or who are already blind with various uh, disorders. So, there are about uh, 10 million blind persons worldwide due to RP as a and uh, eight. So what is the artificial retina? So it's an uh, implantable electronic design, a device designed to stimulate sensation of vision in the eyes. A normal retina has photoreceptors which trigger phototransduction cascade to generate neuronal signals in the presence of light stimuli. And these signals are passed to and processed by a complex network of neurons within the middle layers of the retina before reaching retinal ganglion cells with the inner layers. An axonal process from the retinal ganglion cell layer ultimately form the uh, optic nerve to transmit the light evoked neuronal signals to the visual cortex. It's a, such a complex system God has created and I'm happy we are working on that. And uh, so the who's the ideal candidate for an artificial retina? Vision loss due to degeneration of photoreceptors are the best candidate. So the ganglion cell is uh, involved, uh, like particularly in diabetic retinopathy, artificial retina will not work. And conditions like AMD and RP span the ganglion cells, and this layer of cells responds to artificial stimulus like electronic stimulation. And candidates for visual prosthetic implants or artificial retina find the procedure most successful if the optic nerve was developed prior to the concept of blindness. So, conditions which will be treated are RP, ARMD, Stargardt's disease, macular dystrophies, choroidemia, and Leber's and glabrosis. And there are I remember when I took ophthalmology, my father said, half of the Parsons textbook, you can't practice, why are you studying, and why, why you want to do retina surgery. But that was in the 80s, and now, even today, there's no useful treatment available, but a lot of uh, uh, developments have taken place, and wish we will be able to do something for the people who are blind due to 
the previous uh, oil condition that I mentioned. There are contraindications for the adaptive retina, as is well by diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma blindness, rational detachment, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, severe optic nerve atrophy, and stroke or uh, trauma. The problem is uh, when people think that artificial retina can be used for any blind, which is not possible. Same thing with stem cell and uh, also gene therapy, which I will say. And this is how the uh, artificial retina work is going on from 1996, and that's the uh, first one is from Went I Love, then later Mark Kumayan, who did his, uh, uh, the uh, realization of retinal process for the totally blind in 98, and he actually has a PhD on retinal processes, and uh, later uh, the Vitello again did some, 1999 to 2004, and Mark Kumayan worked on it, and uh, along with James Whelan, they did uh, uh, retinal processes, and Mark Kumayan has done a lot of work, and I'm happy, he's my good friend, and he's supporting for us. So how it works here, this is from the Stanford research where again, how they plan, we can collect the image from the camera, and which will be transmitted to the retina, and then through the optic nerve to the brain. So that's the implant you see, and you can see the layers of the retina. So the type of the implant, you have epiretinal, subretinal, epiretinal, supraparoidal, and again, subretinal. So, so many groups are working on this, and among them, Argus II was very famous, for which uh, Mark Moyen got the best technology award from President Barack Obama. And also, claims uh, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation. It is a technique which they tried, and then uh, so many, uh, that didn't go for a long time. And how it works, as you see here, this is a chip which is placed with a microelectrode array. Camera collects the image. And the image is, uh, it is transferred by connection earlier, and now they're using infrared device where the, this one is converted and uh, passed on to the layers of retina, put up the player and uh, beyond, and then goes to the optic nerve. So that vision is a function of the uh, uh, brain. And that's why our uh, my Elon Musk, uh, who's the, the runs the Tesla car and the uh, Twitter, has uh, now made a brain implant. I don't know how many of you read about two weeks back. And he claims one day we can use the same brain implant in the visual cortex and we can make people see. It looks uh, like a science fiction, but one day it may happen. But still a long way to go because you can see for 35 years the research is going on in artificial retina. Even some have been successful, but still not available as a commercial project. So several groups are working and you can see here they are working on implants in retina, optic nerve, lateral geniculate body and visual cortex. So the first patient to receive a prototype implant in 2002 described what it was like being able to see large letters and to differentiate between a cup, a plate, and a knife after being blind for over 50 years. You can see his joy. So that's why sometimes we wonder what, what the hell a patient is going to see only one letter or one line. But I think to make that blind man see that is a lot of effort because you are converting an image to a electrical signal in the retinal layer and then that is conveyed to the optic nerve. So all this is a, a, a remarkable development, even though you are not able to see uh, so easily to make a patient see. And this is a photodiode uh, array where you have a polymer strip, stimulated chip, uh, which is uh, seen here, and electrodes are placed on the other end of the polymer strip. I tried working with the IIT Bombay, but um, somehow it didn't work through at all. So this is the epiretinal, and that's the subretinal. So they find uh, uh, Subretinal is closer to the photos that we lay, but still, surgery is a more cumbersome, and here, in the over the surface of retina, it's a, uh, comparatively technically easier. So, you at now the Harvard MIT group, Rohini team at uh, University of Southern California, and Professor Rock Ekmuller's team at uh, University of uh, Bonn. And Subretinal is Optobionics, I think that company is also probably not working now. University of Tbilisi probably. Uh, they did some cases in Singapore too, and Wayne State University of Medicine. All this is beginning history because uh, they are not able to continue the project and uh, introduce it. And uh, for optic now we had a Verap from Belgium, Cortical from Nobel in the earliest 1980s, Norman and Schmidt from US, where they did the cortical simulation. <coughs> the complication was uh, uh, or, uh, <coughs> The complication was that sometimes I think one of the patients died and also had a
complication using an cortical implant. Complication because the neurosurgery was not advanced at that time. Only thing to go from ophthalmologist to neurosurgeon. But uh, Elon Musk has removed uh, ophthalmic surgeon, neurosurgeon, and using robot to do that uh, brain implant. So this you had a implantable miniature telescope, tubing in hand, uh, artificial silicon retina, and uh, there's uh, so many. I mean, uh, you had the uh, so many different types of was going, research is going on, and you can imagine there's so much of money being put into research, and still the patients are, we are not able to do that. This was the one which was developed by Dr. Mark Meyer, had a chip which can be placed on the cerebral retina, which was connected outside the eye using the cerebral band, and then it was connected by a wire to the glasses where it was picking up the image and transferring, and now they removed the connection and used the infrared to transfer the image. And this is, a, they also got a FDA approval, and they did a world over except uh, Asia, and they did it in uh, Europe, US and many patients are benefited. My friend Stanis was from uh, Italy did a maximum number of uh, Argus uh, two implants. And you can see there's the video camera and there's the external coil which will be connected and there's the vision process unit which will be used as an Argus two for the patient. So you have to check on the battery, you have to on the system, so it's like booting a computer and then we uh, teach the patient to what he's seeing and interpret, which is again a new learning for the patient. And uh, this is, uh, you can see the, how the chips are made and how it is placed on the surface of retina. So it has to go almost close to the macula and they tag it. And this is what was done uh, for the artificial retina. And then this is a photovoltaic retinal implant called the primer. And uh, again, it's not a successful. And this is the temperature processes from Harvard device. Again, you have the CCD camera in the glasses, so a blind man can wear the glass, and then you need to connect that process to the chip, and then the chip will transmit to the server of right now. And then uh, you also had that uh, APRIC group from Germany, which they did similar to the, uh, what uh, Dr. Mark Mein was doing, and I think Mark Mein on second set had spent a lot of money, and this apparently was developed by Pixium, a uh, research company based in France, and uh, I think technologically they could prove that placing an implant can convert an image, convert it to an electrical signal and make the brain recognize the vision. But somehow we are not able to still make the, uh, the daily surgery for the blind patients. And this is the bionic vision in Australia, supracortical retinal to process implant, first in human trial with a, uh, a novel supracortical retinal process. They are claiming it's working well, but I still not approved, but it's in the experimental stage. And there's a supracortical transfer, retinal stimulation system. And there are many leaders in the field. My friend from Jesper, he was Richard, he was the uh, professor in uh, organ clinic in Hamburg and president of Euratna. He did a lot of work, he retired now. And then uh, we have, uh, he made uh, the other one is uh, Mark Kumar. And then from Dresden, Professor Helmut Sachs, uh, he also did a lot of work. We tried uh, working with him. Uh, again, a supracorridor or a subretina implant, he was interested, but for some of the problem, the thing did not go through. So thanks to Mark Kumail, who is a very perseverant, persistent, and we both introduced the microbiotic surgery first in this part of the world in uh, Mumbai. In 2004, we introduced a product again from motion from that time. At that time, I got the interest of learning my uh, artificial retina work with them, so I went and uh, observed in the animal lab as well as his own uh, clinic in the USC in California. And recently I met him in uh, Nepal where uh, I asked him about what's happening because second site has gone bankrupt where they made the Argus II and no, many other implants are all not able to continue. But uh, now uh, he, he, uh, I mean, he came with the entire uh, team for Indo-China uh, ocular inflammation meeting group and uh, so he he likes to develop that, and this was a picture when he came in 2004 for uh, introducing the microbiotic surgery. And then they, he's now working with the Yu Chong Tai, uh, where he's a professor, founder and a chair and professor of the Department of Medical Engineering at uh, Caltech. And Caltech Institute of Technology is a, has produced the maximum number of uh, Nobel laureates. One of the Nobel laureates has uh, joined, they have formed the company 
and now um, our friend Mark Wine has also joined them as a, a investor and also part of the investigation team. So they have developed a new chip, which I'm so I'm happy. This guy has done a PhD, a Changling Pan from uh, USC again and Caltech Institute of Technology. So he came specially to meet me in Asia Pacific uh, International Meeting in Hong Kong to show like uh, about this uh, implant. Uh, my interest in implant is going on. They are also interested in doing some manufacturing of a chocolate lens in uh, uh, India. So they are visiting many labs. So they came on December 25th to uh, Mumbai. They are a whole team from Los Angeles. And they have an office in Changsha in China and uh, in Los Angeles. And then, uh, so they visited the hospital undergoing renovation and they came to visit and see whether we can do that. And now finally, we, we hope to do, get it that. And this was, uh, uh, he the investor and the CEO of the company. And then you can see. Why am I in this so this is a similar implant, like you have a battery, you have a glasses, uh, and then you have a, a battery device, and this is a implant. You have a glass, and then you get the signals, and then you can transmit the signals to the battery device. So the vision is formed by the electrical stimulation is uh, generated. So the image has to convert to the electrical signal, the electrical signal back to the red line to the brain, and that's where the challenge is. So that's why so much of change is going on. Maybe millions of dollars are being put. Professor Zhu from uh, uh, California is involved, and this is Mark Kumai operating and uh, training for doctors in uh, China. the Interlo Micro Company. And uh, so it's been 40 years since uh, Arne Larson received the first fully implanted cardiac pacemaker at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And researchers throughout the world have looked for ways to improve people's lives with artificial biotic uh, devices. So biotic devices are being developed to do more than replace defective parts. Researchers are also using them to fight illness. That's what uh, uh, Elon Musk wants to use the brain implant for uh, blind people, for uh, Parkinson's, for even controlling computer, and many things, which is, looks like a science fiction. 
providing power to run bionic implants and making connections to the brain's control system pose the two great challenges for biomedical engineering. We are now looking at devices like bionic arms, tongues, noses, etc. And so you can have a bionic man with everything, but uh, the difference between the cardiac, the cochlear implant, and retina, is that the eye has so specialized, and retina has so many layers, which I think uh, that we are nowhere near what cochlear implant or a cardiac implant can do, because both are probably comparatively mechanical, then ours is electromechanical. And then a lot of advances are taking place in gene therapy, so the work is going from 94 till now. So gene therapy where you have a gene replacement and there are, these are the diseases, again, similar disease which was uh, considered for artificial intelligence being used, and gene re re replacement or augmentation, gene editing, gene silencing, and modified gene therapy. So how retinal gene therapy works? The, this is what you need a, a vector, and that's why we as ophthalmologists should be, have a typical examination of retinal dystrophy patient by telling them there is a research going on. And Charles Kieffer says, never tell a patient, never again. You tell the patient, don't give a false hope, but give him a hope, saying the research is going on. Some patients come and fight with me, sir, you are telling this for the last 40 years, when are we going to get it? But we have got a treatment, which I will shortly tell about the one successful treatment going on. You know, it's very expensive, and it's about uh, 400,000 US dollars for one eye. So that is why all the studies are not same, and all RP are not same. There are 200 genes involved, so every patient need a detailed history that will become the, uh, you have to make the uh, pheno phenotype and the genotype. The phenotype includes the detailed family history, comprehensive ophthalmic evaluation, including uh, OCT, fundus photography, autophorosis, electrophysiology, and visual field. And gene therapy is using an adeno adenovirus vector, which is very popular. And they are also using non-viral vectors. So the conditions, again, most of the degeneration can be treated, and the uh, gene started in gene therapy. These are the genes. I'm not uh, reading the name because it's going to be only numbers and boring. But this RP65, you should know, which is only 8%, but now we have a treatment only for RP65 mutation. That's the reason you have to know something about what is the basic work going on. And this is a, where the diffuse progressive dysfunction of predominantly rot photoreceptor with subsequent degeneration of cold photoreceptor and the natural pigment epithelium. And uh, so here you see again uh, various drug name and various uh, for a RP uh, trials are going on. And FDA approved the novel gene therapy to treat patients with a rare form of inherited vision loss. And that's the uh, water gene epavrac, which is what I mentioned. A new gene therapy used in RP65 mutation associated natural dystrophy. In India, we don't see many RP65. One, because we can't investigate every patient because the patient doesn't want to pay for a genetic uh, study because they say, what is the use? So I think we as ophthalmologists do counseling and tell them one day it will happen. So I think we should do that in Malaysia too. So you should find out which channel. So there's a clinical trials.gov where you see their promising broad core distribution gene therapy uh, going on. And then uh, and there's a phase one trial going on. And this is how the gene set therapy uh, which has been uh, used. Alangan is doing nanoscope therapeutics. And then uh, there's a RGX314 gene therapy administered in the supracordial space for participants with new astral AMD. And then uh, this is an ongoing phase one and uh, where, where they were published. And uh, uh, this is the one where the Luxturna, which is made by, uh, marketed by Novartis World Over, Genentech in, uh, in, in US, where you, you have to do a vitrectomy and inject this in the subluxal space. And that's where they are using the first robotic retinal surgery in the world. And this, they publish Nature Medicine, subluxal uh, temporary page in Europe in adult men with choroidermia, which is uh, again choroidermia is very common in uh, uh, US rather than the rest of the world. Rare, excellent, uh, this is an inherited retinal degeneration resulting in progressive vision loss, ultimately leading to blindness. So this is again a retinal gene therapy in patients with the choroidermia, the initial report. So to prevent disease by inserting a gene into patient cell instead of using drugs or surgery, replacing a mutated gene that causes disease with a healthy copy of the gene, inactivating or knocking out a mutated gene, and that is functioning improperly. 
introducing new gene into the body to help fight a disease. Those are the gene therapy or what. So in my late father's death, I started a genetic clinic. That's Professor Lahane and my friend, Mr. Kumar Amani, the professor of high genetics, one of the uh, one person who okay, is also president of the Asia Pacific uh, Ocular Genetics in, in this part of the world. And he was part of us, and then uh, we inaugurated in the 2017, and that's the team we're working. And we are only making, a, and we have a plaza that are the team, and then our aim is to do study of all these diseases and try to get patients uh, enrolled. So we are also, this, these are the various clinical trials which is happening, we have seen the various references. But even though it's happening, we, today we cannot tell a patient who and get it done, but except Luxturna. And gene therapy and CRISPR modulated gene editing for natural diseases, Dr. Subaroyam uh, presented in the ASR at that time, and thanks to him for uh, giving me this slide. And uh, where are we now in the gene therapy? So the gene therapy, as I mentioned, it's an evolution and growth of gene therapy has turned into an encouraging option for treatment of uh, IMDs, the inherited natural disease. Don't tell a patient you can't treat, but I think one day it will happen. Maybe the uh, uh, days are a few years now. So this work is going on from 1940, and first gene therapy for a children with severe combined immunity happened in 1934 years back. And that's the same year I started I think you know, the SNDC also came, but it takes time for any treatment to come. So this is the problem of uh, the genetic uh, thing which I mentioned. So we have made a, a process flow for a genetic clinic, which I feel all of you should do as a clinician, on a regular eye hospital, the demographic collection, ophthalmic evaluation, possible clinical diagnosis, pre-test counseling, the targeted exome sequencing is expensive, and that's why we have written a project and applied to a grant in the uh, government of India, hope to get it post-test genetic counseling because when before uh, diagnosis, uh, before genetic testing, you may have labeled as uh, some uh, star guards, but it will be different after doing genetic testing. So you have to know which uh, after the genetic testing. So both the phenotype and genotype should be known and then re-diagnose the patient. And that's what uh, we are trying to do now. So we have made a, a research team and uh, the idea is to tell one day we'll be able to do, as I said, there are 200 genes responsible for inherited diseases. So only one treatment is successful now. But this, this uh, one, I think once, it, uh, as I said, it's 400,000 US dollar. So here you inject the, uh, the, the vector into the subretinal space where the regeneration is there. In both type of disease, vision loss occurs primarily because of progressive retinal photosynthesis. that there. The need for new treatment strategy is complete. And these are the common inherited retinal degeneration where we see in the clinic. And uh, so they identify new target genes, development of viral vectors. So, and then uh, this we already mentioned how the vector uses gene editing and uh, how it uh, corrects, and corrects the disease. So virus is used as a vector. And then you can see that it cannot be injected. They tried just, just injecting the intravitreal doesn't work, so you have to go in the subretinal space and inject. So if you go through the water gene uh, pamphlet, they say you have to inject subretinal, but you have to do a vitreal surgery. So all of us know vitreal surgery has complications, and my interest as a vitreal surgeon is one day all this gene therapy will come to retinal surgeon for uh, uh, getting it done. So the intravitreal doesn't work. The first six patients treated at the Oxford Eye Hospital were all able to see better in dim light. In two, the effect had been described as dramatic. The scientists first modified a harmless virus to carry a working copy of a human gene that sufferers lack. They then used a fine needle to reach the back of the eye where they inject the virus behind the retina. The virus then infected light-sensitive cells, releasing the gene which started producing protein that helped to preserve vision. Rather than taking a pill or, or proteins or, or taking Just a tablet, we're actually correcting the disease at the genetic level. In other words, genetically modifying the patient who have the problem to put the gene back that's missing. But also, we're very excited because potentially gene replacement is a way of stopping the disease from starting in the first place. And we could genetically modify people to prevent them from getting the disease and hopefully prevent them from losing their sight. Around a thousand people in Britain suffer from choroideremia, but the same technique could treat far more common genetic causes of blindness, including age-related macular degeneration. Doctors are so excited by the results of the that they've already started another trial. 
and you see 41 gig in, in, in the sub space. space. That's five years. Thomas More Sky News. So you can imagine if you have the 3D, you can have a white screen and see better. Chordermia is a rare genetic disease in which photoreceptors in the retina, an underlying vascular layer, known as a chorite, degenerate. Degeneration of the retina and chorite begins during childhood and develops into blindness in old age. Chordermia is caused by a defective CHN gene. In the gene therapy, a functional copy of the gene is inserted into a virus vector. The vector is then used to deliver the gene to the degenerating photoreceptors in the retina. This has to be done by vitreoidal surgery and not just inject like that. You saw Dr. Ma Robert Matlab spending a lot of time in the OT. So this is what we have to do in the subretinal space. And the number of uh, viruses that we are injecting and should not come out. So they are doing all Six of the nine patients enrolled in the therapy trial have reported improved vision six months following treatment. So there's a lot of uh, scope for improvement and uh, it's not still commercially available. So you see how the, the Luxtruna is being injected into the cervical space. And uh, so this is the RP65 the protein is produced in a thin layer of cells at the back of the eye called retinal pigment epithelium. And RP65 gene provides instruction for making a protein that is essential for normal vision. Converts all trans retinal to 11 cis retinol, which subsequently forms 11 cis retinol during the visual cycle. So this is the visual cycle which is seen. And mutations in the RP65 gene lead to vision loss due to loss of function or death of RP cells and eventually degeneration of photoreceptors. So mutations in RP65 gene lead to progressive degeneration in one of the more major cause of uh, liver amaurosis, uh, congenital amaurosis, and a small proportion of RP patients. And night blindness or difficulty adapting to dark conditions from early childhood is a prominent symptom. So these are the patients can be followed up and can be encouraged saying clinical trials are going on, it is successful. And I think uh, so the only problem is they don't take outstation patients from out, out of uh, US patients that have to stay there for a year or two to go for various testing every month. And uh, these are the and patients are presented with misdiagnosis, sluggish uh, pupil response, severely decreased visual acuity, photophobia, and high hyperopia. And uh, as of 2019, UK patients with retinal degeneration due to mutations of RP65 can be treated in the form of gene therapy called Luxtruna under the National Health Care Service. So that's a good news for the UK people. So Luxtruna is a medicine that is used to treat adults and children with loss of vision due to inherited retinal dystrophy, and a genetic disorder of the retina. And the last one has to be actually uh, do a retinal surgery and inject into the subretinal space, and that's how uh, it will help to work. And you, you see the subretinal blip is <coughs> created, which you saw in the Robert McLaren's surgery. So here you see how it's injected. <laughs> For sufferers of hereditary blindness, there may be a light at the end of the tunnel. Two experimental trials have shown that gene therapy could one day cure a rare form of blindness that affects about 2,000 Americans. The research teams tested the treatment on a total of six patients. Here you can see how they performed the eye surgery. Repair genes were injected into the eye of this young visually impaired patient. The eye was infused with air, then reinfused with fluid near the end of the surgery. To measure the patient's performance before and after the treatment, he was guided through an obstacle course. Here, you can see how he navigated through the maze prior to the surgery. He bumped into obstacles six times and was disoriented twice. It took him 77 seconds to finish the course. Six months after the treatment, the patient showed a dramatic improvement. He was able to make his way through the maze in 14 seconds without bumping into anything or getting disoriented. He was one of four patients that showed an improvement. The treatment also proved to be safe, which has not been the case with previous gene therapy trials. Well, 
I think the main thing is that you can see we change the way of vision improvement checking. I don't know whether you read about the new two drugs which has come for uh, dry matter degeneration, geographic latrophy, where they measure only the photoreceptor layer using the uh, uh, the uh, auto the, uh, and uh, you know, patient vision can only be maintaining and 20% success rate. So the problem is with this, so much of expensive medicine, the uh, results are a problem and that's what happens in the beginning of the any of the trial. So this can be done in the RP sector. So the, the, there were several research questions. Is it safe and is it available? There are a lot of things available in the net. Let me see that. Caroline and Cole Carper have been through more than your typical siblings. I, I can't imagine it being any different than the two of them being together and going through this together. Uh, you know, they've had canes together. They've tried to learn Braille together. Uh, they've gone to school for the blind and visually impaired together. Early in their lives, they were both diagnosed with a rare genetic retinal disease called LCA, or Leber Congenital Amaurosis. The doctor really said, there's nothing, there's no medical treatments at this time. Both Caroline and Cole were expected eventually to go blind, but their parents found an experimental treatment. And two years ago, the kids enrolled together in a clinical trial. It was with Spark Therapeutics, a young biotech company formed out of research from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The idea is that we are taking a correct functional copy of a gene and adding it back into the cells that have a dysfunctional or missing copy of that gene or blueprint. It's called gene therapy, and it's relatively uncharted territory in medicine. The technology uses a modified virus to deliver a healthy copy of a gene to make up for one that causes disease. Scientists have Before their surgeries, both kids had trouble seeing in low light. Now, though their vision's not perfect, they say they're noticing big differences. Good things are to come. Um, so I didn't so know. I was so I like, think oh. a lot of things are going on. So now uh, to inject that subnational space, the gene therapy, the vector. So there's a lot of work going on. She's a Dr. Fanny, the Indian origin, born in India, but living from the a few months age in the Belgium, in Gen City. And she's Dr. Fanny, who does the artificial retina um, using the, sorry, uh, gene therapy using the robotic surgery. So this is a robot made by a company. Uh, now the company has been taken over by Zeiss. I'm trying to get it for India. So, the problem is technology takes time, it's expensive, so, uh, so this is the fine tip which is a 40, 41 gauge needle where through which the uh, robot is using the subatomic injection. Where they find micro tremors, uh, even how good steady hand you have, which can be removed using the robot. So, but the surgeon has to feel, place the robot in a position and then the injection can be done using the foot switch and the robot will Inject, you can see the interoperative OCT to check the uh, subarachal injection, which is being done at the robotic surgery. I hope one day uh, that you can see the blimp which is happening in the interoperative OCT. And so, not only has treatment is not going to change the lives of people previously just trying to live a life of blindness, but has fuel interest in developing additional gene therapy reagents, targeting numerous other genetic inheritance. So there's a lot of hope, even though uh, this part of the world we don't have any of those treatment available, but one day it should be possible. And recently new devices have been developed for a subarachal injection, and then um, we from uh, um, our Aditi Jodh working with the Government of India, Department of Biotechnology, starting a clinical registry for Indian International Regeneration. And we have uh, my colleague, Lord Jaydi, uh, we are working on that. And uh, this is uh, Elon Musk said, Neuralink's work on supplementing or supplementing eyesight is coming. After the current work on assisted motor control, that is the next year, area after the enabling phone, computer, telepathy, for those who have lost their mind, body connection. Musk added, we are waiting for regulatory approval for our first human. This was in November 23. They got a, uh, their uh, FDA approval and first impact is done in February 2024. And these are the references. The other uh, uh, thing which is happening is retinal stem cell 
all of us know it's a successful in cornea and unfortunately in retina still not successful even though the work is going on for more than 30 years with the pluripotent cells and different types of these are the different which is there the reference on uh, stem cell how is it being used and a lot of work is being uh, done but still not uh, successful and here again the stem cells are injected into the cerebral space so we need technology on one side the basic scientists are developing all this in the lab and the biomedical engineering the scientists and then we as a veterinary surgeon have to deliver it in the right space for the treatment so these are the various stem cell clinical trials going on in the world and uh, i just met dr kapil bhatti who is the director of uh, uh, intramural research in national institute of medicine part of nih who is working on stem cell and then uh, this is the uh, designation and he has written several uh, publications on developing cellular therapies for retinal degenerative disease for the last uh, decade and then uh, is there a rp target for the stem cell i mean there's a lot of uh, basic science work is required so in collaboration with nih skin biopsies of patients with clinically diagnosed degenerative retinal disease were taken and these biopsies are being used to derive ips cells and rp cells differentiated from such ips cells are used to study events that have led to degenerative disease initiation and progression in collaboration with the new ni center for regenerative medicine ipc and derived rp tissue cell or cell based therapy is being formed you know, you should have read in uh, nature the work done by japan which has the biggest stem cell of the yamanaka got the nobel prize uh, at the age of 49 for stem cell but uh, for the same ipsc but in the retina there is a problem of it can also produce uh, uh, tumors so he did a program with a company called istem when uh, in the but they have a company both in the us and anglo and uh, kapil bharti is now the director so thank you so much for a uh, patient listening and i hope uh, you will keep in the stretch but one day all this treatment what has been possible will be possible
but we have to be patient, and patient also has to be, and the relatives have to be realistic. Because uh, so many patients come and I, uh, now fortunately, I have developed patients uh, over the years, otherwise I used to get angry with them. Now I don't get angry at them, research is going on, that's why it's called research, and we don't know when you will get, you have to wait patiently. Whenever it comes, we'll operate. We won't say you are you're, you're blind. Just keep us told me the same, and which is very good for any patient. So these kind of technologies are nice to read in the paper because once they read, all the blind patients are unfortunately thinking they will be benefiting. That's another problem. But you know, they, they also have to do some marketing to collect money. They need billions of dollars, not million. No, that's a problem. This question because a lot of patients were coming to me actually to ask about this about the total eye transplant. They have been asking for ages. Can you implant the whole eye? So actually I put up a blog uh, and I put a video also explaining the whole thing. That nerve tissue cannot be cannot regenerate and we have no way at the moment to do that. But research is going on. And yes. also one thing which you uh, mentioned somewhere uh, is very important and all of us healthcare workers, uh, healthcare uh, technicians, doctors, all uh, can have it in our system that uh, like we all get patients who have been told uh, this treat RPE example is a condition which cannot be treated and you are going to go blind and they never say that but when the patient comes to me I tell them don't worry usually the patients don't go blind till 60 60 plus of course every person is different so we must give them some hope yes all the time never say right. never as you said not a false hope that's why not a false hope it is true we are not uh, when you say little hope they have a, a, a long a lot of hope that's the problem at the same time i agree with you i also have everyday patients coming and tell some doctor told me at the age of 50 you'll go blind i always tell nobody's god even i'm not god and no doctor can tell you what will happen 30 years later today you're 10 year old you're having rp you're having six nine and maybe a tubular vision so you don't know, you may live 100 years with the same tubular vision. The worst is when they don't even say that, they say you will go blind, that is it, they don't right. say that. that is the young, young patients, 30 year old, 25 year old, if he, he or she is told that uh, they are going to go blind, their life is almost long. Correct, the whole so, family is affected. Yeah. So we are not added. lying to them when we say that research is going on, so I actually call them every year. Uh, uh, one, we see the progression, how the disease is progressing and uh, we see for any other conditions he might be developing along with it. Like many of them actually even have little, little cataracts and if you remove their cataracts, the vision, they, they're very happy with the yes. vision even if uh, they have little cataracts, not much. So uh, we keep calling them every year and uh, then update them on what research is going on. Yes. And I think all of us uh, should keep in mind that when a patient comes to us, we must never discourage them and try. Of course, we, have, we don't have to lie and give false hope as you say but uh, we should tell them that uh, there is hope and sure i think it's uh, that's important and then recently even in ophlotoma i don't recommend primary manipulation for no PLI. Well, we saw two patients being told in a big city like mumbai that you remove and then they called me and i repaired could save both the eyes not the vision vision i'm going to do multiple vision surgery but what i'm saying whatever uh, so many years of practice so many people are doing in research I think it should be conveyed to the people in a proper perspective, which is our duty. And as you said, everybody, all the... Yeah, those things, because we used to worry about sympathetic ophthalmia, all those yeah. things. But now it's a kind of a rare kind of a condition. Yeah. I haven't seen one for, I don't know how many years. No, we have to see anything I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? We have to play here. We, have, we need CMEs like this only for that. That's why these two topics, my favorite, because uh, many people have not heard, and which yeah. I want to tell all our medical people. The one day it will happen. A yeah, fantastic lecture, Rajan, as usual. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Microphone. Prof, Prof thank you for the excellent uh, lectures and the update. Uh, it was really, really useful. Um, I have two questions. My first question is, in your experience, do you think stem cell therapy has, uh, you know, any role um, for the future in restoring vision in the, the many patients that have inherited diseases 
in which the photoreceptors degenerate. So that's my first question regarding stem cell therapy. My second question is that I think before um, we take on this gene therapy, uh, especially here locally, I also agree with you that the vitroretinal surgeons have a great role. Um, however, before we embark into this, our own population has its, its unique genetic makeup. And uh, how, how would you advise us if we, you know, as, a, as an ophthalmology community and fraternity, how should we um, start in our preparation towards um, identifying the appropriate genes and so on in our own unique population? Yes, I feel Dr. Takeshi and I brought him, I don't know whether for the APO, uh, he's the president of uh, a global eye genetic consortium and I'm the vice president. So there in Japan, he is in the Tokyo Medical Center. So what he propagates is to have a, a software to have the phenotype and genotype. Phenotype means clinical appearance, fundus photograph, uh, autofluorescence, red free photograph, then uh, VERG wherever applicable, and any other test applicable, and have a clinical diagnosis. And then you do a genetic testing, and then re like that's what I mentioned on the other side. So you have to again, so that has to be developed. The problem is there they are able to do free. There's some company called Macrogen is doing it free for them. And US also, entire uh, biobanking, they're doing it free. I think they have, the, that's why they're able to do a lot of clinical trials. In India, it's a big problem, because nobody is doing free, neither the government nor the universities. So patient has to pay, so patient is not willing to pay. They ask me a first question, sir, if I do the test, what is my benefit? I immediately tell them, it's only for documenting and diagnosing. Then what they will ask me? I said, at present, nothing. One day treatment will come. Okay, then we'll do the, uh, the genetic testing. That time they're telling. So now I'm approaching the government of India for a project for a grant, saying that we'll do a phenotype, genotype, and do the uh, genetic testing, and then keep the patient ready for a clinical trial. So if somebody says they have a new treatment for star guards, we'll have a hundred patients ready with the, all the phenotype, and because all phenot all genotypes will not be treated by one gene. So we may have to have different gene therapy available for. They were like this Lacturna is only for RP65. Two of my patients were ready, but when they did a genetic testing, they were upset that they, they don't have a RP65 mutation. And and it's in, in Indian rupees, it is like four four crores for one eye, 400,000 US dollar. I don't know how they were ready, but anyway, they were ready. Like it's not easy, so much money. And then uh, there are also the stem cell work done in uh, Mark Kumai told me, they are not published, where the recent subretinal injections have developed uh, Lateral attachment, PVR. So those complications of producing iatrogenic, not iatrogenic, that uh, uh, required retinotomy also can produce retinal problems. So we have to know the complications of retinal surgery. What was their first question? I forgot. About the stem cells. Uh, stem cell, what is the question? Do you see any future for stem cells? Yes, yes, definitely. Therapy. See, that is why I'm looking at it. As I said, Professor Yamanaka's team, uh, her name is Tarasaki. She did the first uh, uh, human trial using the iPSC uh, stem cells. And unfortunately, two years later, they found there may be a risk for uh, cancer development. And that's what is the problem they are facing. And that's why this guy is now developing from the skin. The technology is a problem. But it will happen. So that's why there are two companies in India. I know one is, they both are US based with the Indian uh, thing in Nano Stem, Putix and uh, uh, I Stem. There are, there are a lot of companies. The problem is they need so much money. They start as a startup with some private equity, and then after that, either they vanish or till they don't come into the clinical trial. It will happen. So, corneal stem cell has been revolutionized now, but the retinal stem cell is a problem. The retina is a, the I always tell, even in the, the Embryon, em, embryonic development, the cornea is a, a surface ectoderm, it develops, and retina is developed from neuroectoderm. So it's a part of the uh, 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 central nervous system. So it's not easy. That's why even artificial brain is uh, he's trying to chip and all, but it's a lot of uh, 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 biomedical uh, compatibility between the human and, and the brain has to come. But he's trying to say it's going to happen. Like when you think the computer, you can open, you can open the screen, and all that Google doing anything, which is just by your mind. He's calling telepathy. So it's, oh, it'll happen. It looks like science fiction. And I, I think that the one drug, or not drug, that uh, laparoscopic, they were injecting a, a tablet-like camera into the GI system, and they could track the entire from the esophagus to the anus, which was a science fiction. But now it's plausible. 
practically they are able to do that. So I think technology will improve and we have to be realistic and the patients also we have to make them realistic because they think you do the surgery and I will see. And the, and the movies make this problem I think. And in that other uh, Amar Shah brother's movie, which one is that? Very, the eye will, uh, one eye will remove and put it and he will put it. Do you know, everybody thinks it's so easy. And as he said, this full, uh, the face transplant, the eye they have transplanted, uh, anatomically successful, but not functionally. So the patients want to get uh, some ray of hope and they want to be. And if we don't get, uh, if we don't tell them the truth, it's a problem. So I always tell the parents, why should you trouble the child by bringing often and in front of the child asking, does the child go blind, what is that? I said, why do you want to discuss in front of the child? Let the child know only that much vision is normal vision. I know my big patients who never went, I'm saying my father is an ophthalmologist, 40 years back I remember, she thought uh, she never wore a glass till the of some 15 years of age, and she thought everybody has 3 meter vision. And once she went in glass only, she knew 6-6 six, six vision is normal. So I think ignorance is with some deputy, they should be able to use any type of glow vision aids or some technology to learn, study, and do whatever they can. They should do. And I, that's why now the word blind has been removed. They want all of us to use it visually challenged. And blind has become a bad word. So I made a foundation in India called Blind Free India Foundation. One day I want to remove the blind. It's not easy. It's going to be almost impossible to read. But the word impossible has, I am possible. If I did not, so I'm happy your son is there. Oh, he will do whatever I said now. We don't know whether in our lifetime we will do it. Because I have seen eye surgery from my three years old. Because my grandfather was eye surgeon, my father was eye surgeon, putting torch and doing cataract surgery. Intracapsular, I have done intracapsular myself, and I have seen the Kauchi, and, and, and you can see, I mean, uh, I think the technology is developing, we have to be realistic and, and get the best. And I think sometimes we ourselves tell no problem with easy. Why should we want to use the word easy? It should be used technologically challenging, including FECO. But all of us tell it's a five minute surgery. And one out of thousand has the problem who comes to us, either UEITs or macular edema or actual no. no it's, it, I think stem cell has a lot of challenge in that now. And that's why there's the entire department called Intramural Research and NIH, they are doing it. A lot of money they are putting. I'm glad he was doing that. And this part of the world, I'm happy. I think Malaysia has learned the infra infrastructure is definitely much better than India for I mean, regular and whatever we are seeing outside. But in medicine, somebody should convince the health minister to put money on the research. So they yeah. don't expect that. Uh, or even companies were doing well. I'm sorry, in, in spite of that, they're all giving for charity in India, but not for research. But in the US, I mean, whether it's Johns Hopkins or Stanford, successfully treated patients, or even or whatever, they're treated patients, even if they're not successful, they're giving $100 million and a uh, billion dollar amount, which is what we need in, in the world. Yeah, we, we have a lot of problems also getting our stem cell, you know, in, you know, injected into human patients. Um, they're very, very stringent. So I think those are the challenges that we're facing here. And uh, as for the gene therapy, yeah, um, we, we don't have any, any grants or anything. So I think that's one of the major challenges we are facing for our patients to be properly, you know, identified. What is their genetic but thank you for sharing uh, yes. those great insights, Rob. So you should, to keep I think for Malaysia, you being the president of the Red Man Board, you can create a, a group of interested in the inheritance of the mission and create a, a registry, even though some patients will not do their genetic test. But I think you have a clinical diagnosis with all the tests done, except genetic. If the patient can afford, they can do a genetic test. See, it should become like a sugar test for a patient, which is, I think, I don't know where is that, communication gap is happening. Somebody has said that, oh, you are born with a bit less vision, get a blood genetic testing done. But I think more and more genetic tests is done, then the cost will come down, I think. We need to get together on this, yeah, with yes. our colleagues both here and outside. Thank you. Yes. So no other person is asking, Gayatri? Yeah. Or you have any questions, Gayatri? Paul Singh has not told anything. He's seeing more ophthalmology than me. No? 
I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude on behalf of Tun Hussein to Dr. Nadrajan for this wonderfully illuminating talk on exciting things in the horizon of ophthalmology. Please give him a good round of applause. For <laughs>